Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study some fantastic chapters in the book of Isaiah. We actually cover quite a few chapters, and so we'll use some themes as we go along today, as we go from chapter 13 all the way up to 35. So the Come Follow Me curriculum skips a few chapters. If you want more details, you want to study those in your, in your own time, like I would love to do and do, um, I am a little partial, but I do have my two volumes set on Isaiah, and it's a verse-by-verse -verse commentary titled Isaiah Prophet's Prophet. I also want to just say, those of you who are watching the video, thank you for your kindness. Um, I'm noticing that, that uh, I get people who show they like the video. Uh, that's very appreciated. Thank you. Here's where I'm headed. In all the videos, all five that I'll be doing on Isaiah, I'm going to be focusing on the relevance and applicability of Isaiah because I think that's where Nephi heads. Here's why it's applicable. Here's why it's relevant, how it's relevant, and that it gives hope to all of us. And as you study Isaiah's inspired advice, in today's readings, it's to a nation in peril. They have a big threat and they're struggling. Let's look at Isaiah, what he teaches a nation in peril, what he emphasizes, what is he warning, what hope does he give, and maybe compare that with what modern day prophets are telling us today. What are they doing to warn us, to inspire us, to give us hope? And then one of the great highlights is chapter 29, a prophecy of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And once again, a shout out to Cedar Fort for their uh, graciousness in helping me get my publication done. Every week, I'm just going to re review this because I believe Isaiah is relevant and applicable. Nephi says it is there to more fully help persuade us to believe in Jesus Christ. And we want to see Jesus Christ in these chapters. These chapters are going to give us hope. And also, they're here to help us lift up our hearts, to rejoice. And we're encouraged to compare them to our lives. And I'm going to do that today. In 2 Nephi 25, we're, uh, they're meant to be understood. They're of great worth. They're for our day. And they're going to be fulfilled. So we have that encouragement to study them diligently because greater are the words of Isaiah. So let's get together and do that. This is the second week that we're in Isaiah. We're going to go 13 and 14, 25 to 30, and 35. And there's a few chapters that are skipped you know, during this lesson, and 36 to 39, and I'll give a little bit of that at the end of, the, of this video. <clears throat> but five fabulous weeks, I'm very grateful for it. <clears throat> if you want a little bit more study, I know the books, I also have some videos that I did in an adult religion class. We were just coming out of the pandemic. So I would go after we, I taught the class. Then I'd go back home and just, okay, let me record these. And so there's not a lot of editing in them, but they're a resource, a little bit more detail than what I cover here. And then I also have done videos on all of the books or all the cha Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon. It's much more an application. Here's a few verses. Here's a theme out of that chapter, how it can apply to us today. It's one application. So if you're interested in any of those videos that may be helpful as we're studying some of these uh, chapters in, in Isaiah, please go there. All that can be found at brothermiller.org. Now, Isaiah 13 focuses on Babylon. Babylon it was an incredible city in its time. It's located on the Euphrates River. And it was there for thousands of years. It's located about 90 kilometers south of modern-day Baghdad. It was situated on trade routes between the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean Sea, which just made it ideal for people to congregate and trade. It was famous for its architecture. Uh, you have when Nebuchadnezzar makes it its capital. It is the largest city in the world. Um, about 6th century B.C., the size of the city was 10 square kilometers. It boasted one of the ancient seven wonders of the world. And that was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It was supposed to be just drop-dead gorgeous. In Babylon, it was also, they were academically brilliant. Um, like, for example, they had the first recorded solution to a quadratic equation. This picture is that for the square root of 2. They also had recorded all of the mo movements of planets. Like, this is the movements of the planets of Jupiter. I mean, it looks kind of like scribbles to me, but 2014, they deciphered it. Here's all of Jupiter's movements. 
Um, and then this tablet gives positions of the planets. It's on front and back. It's going to give uh, solstices, equinox, ellipses, and just, hey, zodiac signs. They were well-versed in astronomy. They were pretty good with their buildings, too. They were outstandingly fun to, to see. This is a reconstruction of one of the gates leading in for the walls of the city going into Babylon. And this is in a museum in Berlin. They had epic uh, just books. The Epic of Gilgamesh was described as a world's first true work of literature. Just number one, first one. And that also comes from Babylon. I guess I'm bringing all this up because there's a lot of good things in Babylon. And in Scripture, there are three words that are used in the book of Revelation, the three Ds that describe Babylon. And they're actually pretty nice words. The three Ds of, of the describing Babylon are, now this is 18.3, all nations and the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That's things that are choice, expensive, fine, that's delicacy. And then, in chapter 18, verse 9, Babylon is described as delicious. And the kings of the earth live deliciously with her. That's something delicious, highly pleasant, delightful. Sometimes we think of Babylon, we're only thinking of the, of the evils. But if you were back then, you'd see that there's a lot of good things in there too. And we'll talk about symbolic in, in just a minute of the bad. Okay, the third D of Babylon in the book of Revelations, and all things which were dainty. Dainty is pretty, particularly good to eat. So Babylon is described as having world-class literature. It's famous buildings, architecture, renowned mathematicians, academics. It was a destination for world travelers in its day. It had an abundance of delicacies. They lived deliciously. Things were dainty. And Isaiah doesn't focus on any of that. Chapter 13, he talks about Babylon and a burden. The burden of Babylon. And you think, well, what is the burden of Babylon? In my introduction to chapter 13 of the book, here's what I wrote. The burden of Babylon, Isaiah 13, 1, refers to the weighty or mournful prophecies that Isaiah has seen. The rise and destruction of Babylon are identified as a type for the destruction of the wicked on the earth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Babylon represents all governments and their citizenries who oppose or fight against the kingdom of God. The finery and glitter of Babylon are fundamental elements of Satan's great blueprint of his evil designs and practices. So in scripture, you get those three Ds, but there's also the other side of it. Yeah, there may be some really good things to taste and, and experience and see, but Babylon makes its money by marketing people. They sell people as slaves. They market the souls of men. Babylon's made rich in Scripture at the expense of others. In Scriptures, Babylon has the side where it's focused on carnality, sensuality. It markets and sells sex. It's known as a center of iniquity and worldliness. Babylon, in Scriptures, is in opposition to righteousness. So you have the righteous, Jerusalem, that's the symbolic one. It's the holy city. That's where you have the house of the Lord. That's the temple. It's Jerusalem's a symbolic of earth's earthly or Lord's earthly kingdom. It's a symbol of freedom. Babylon's the exact opposite. Whereas Jerusalem's the holy city, Babylon's the evil metropolis. There's fifty false gods and temples to false gods. Babylon's symbolic of Lucifer's kingdom. Babylon is there to take saints captive. And that's why you get this chapter heading of chapter 13 of Isaiah, the destruction of Babylon. Even though it has all these good things that you could look at and go, ah, that's good, that's good. What it, why it does the good things is based on evil intent. And it's a, it's a type of the destruction of the wicked at the second coming. It'll be a day of wrath and vengeance. Babylon will fall forever. Well, Babylon, just a little bit of history and its fall. And then where we're headed is how it compares to destruction of the wicked. It allies with the Medes as they attack their the rival Assyria. Assyria was the big bad guy, and they defeat Assyria. Nineveh falls in 607 BC. 
Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon at the time, and they become the superpower. You know, their rival is Egypt. Egypt's always been around as a power. And the big showdown happens at Carchemish. And in 605 BC, big battle, Egypt loses, Babylon wins. So after uh, Babylon's, after Assyria's downfall, Babylon becomes Nebuchadnezzar's capital. This is the, the place for everybody to be. It's the largest, most elaborate city in the world. The walls around it are 56 miles in circumference, 335 feet high, 85 feet wide. It is said that you could have chariots on top, and one chariot could be going one way full speed, another chariot could be going the other way full speed, and they could pass each other, not hit each other. It was supposed to be impenetrable. Well, here's the events that lead to the fall of, De of Babylon, and then we'll apply it to the fall of Babylon in the future. They had an unpopular king. The, the king, Belshazzar, he was just not interested in being king. He'd much rather be out like an Indiana Jones. He wanted to be out uh, excavating places, seeing ancient sites, bring him in, and he's supposed to be in at all these festivals. And the festivals, what he's supposed to do is he's supposed to go up to the god, shake the god's hand. The god's then symbolically supposed to say, hey, we're bringing favor of Babylon. You're the, you're the representative of these false gods. And he's like, I don't want anything to do with it. So he doesn't show up to the festivals. And people, now, now bad things happen. Like, well, if he would have been here during the festival and would have shaken the god's hand and we'd done a little ritual, we'd be having, we'd be having prosper, prosperity. He gets now... Anything's going wrong, he gets blamed because he's just not there. He's in absenteeism. Now, the inhabitants are very focused on themselves. In Babylon, that is their theme of the day. What's in it for me? Their defenses look really good on paper, but they're really not very good. They're very easy to go around. They are internally divided. When the king's gone, there's a power vacuum and other rival things um, Rival individuals and groups are filling that vacuum. They're very much divided. So when Isaiah in chapter 13 foretells the destruction of Babylon, he's looking at the Babylon, what's going to happen, but the Babylon the future too, at the second coming of Christ. There will be a banner raised to gather the righteous to flee Babylon. That's chapter 13, verse 2. Verse 4, the Lord of hosts himself is going to muster or gather the hosts of the battle. The wicked will be afraid, in verse 8, and have pains and sorrows. The stars of heaven, verse 10, will not give their light. The sun will be darkened, in verse 10. And the Lord says, I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, in verse 11. And there will be no protection and no escape for the wicked. And just so you know, both the Babylonian Chronicles and the Cyrus Cylinder describe how Babylon was taken without a battle. And the Greek historians, uh, Herodias and Xenophon, they report the city was besieged. Book of Daniel implies that Babylon was taken in one night and that the king was killed. And apparently here's kind of what happened. You have the river Euphrates goes kind of right down through the middle of the town. And the attacking army realized, you know, we can't really go over. We're not going to go through these walls. Let's just block Euphrates, so the Euphrates is diverted, floods everything else, and then the conquering army comes in where the Euphrates was and slips in. And as they come in, the the inhabitants of Babylon, you know, they have very much divided, but it's a, it's a celebration. They're so focused on being drunk in their celebration. They hear things, they hear some sounds. Yeah, it could be like celebration, could be fighting, we don't care. The imposing army is well into Babylon before they even realize what's happened. And if you were to go to Babylon today, this is what you'd see. This is the modern day of Babylon. And uh, the chief, the famous building that was there, here's a little bit, was the Temple of Bel. And that's what's left. Here are some parallels of the destruction of Babylon to the second coming. Before the second coming, it is prophesied that there will be an enzyme raised to gather the righteous to flee out of Babylon. That enzyme prophecy is the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. The Lord of hosts himself will gather the host of the battle. He's on one side. His side's going to win. The wicked will be afraid when Christ comes, have pains and sorrows. The stars of heaven will not give their light. The sun will be darkened. God will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. There will be no protection or escape for the wicked. 
There are prophecies, just like with Babylon, that the wicked will be in the state of wars, conflicts, internal conflicts, civil wars, and the destruction of the wicked will be relatively quick. Now, Bruce R. McConkie took some parallels of the destruction of Babylon and the parallels to the second coming. He had four of them. He's first one. As the Jews were carried captive into Babylon, so the church and the kingdom were set up by the Lord Jesus was overcome by the world. And as false prophets arose in Israel to cry peace and safety, to announce falsely that the Jews could soon be free from Babylonic bondage, so false ministers in an apostate Christendom professed to make salvation available to men on terms and conditions of their own. As the Jews came forth out of Babylon, freed from captivity, so the call goes forth today to flee from Babylon and the chains of worldliness, and to come to that liberty wherewith Christ has made men free. And fourth, as Babylon was destroyed with violence, never to rise again, so shall it soon be with spiritual Babylon. She too will be swept from the earth, and hell will be filled with her municipals. A lot of times when we talk about Babylon and that happening and them being destroyed, we think, oh, it's destroyed right then and just fades away and you don't see it anymore. Just so you know, another parallel, I think, with Babylon and its destruction to the second coming is that Babylon just doesn't fade away. Alexander the Great, he makes Babylon his capital before he dies in 323 BC. And so even after it's conquered, it's, it's really in a state of a capital. It's, it's people are flocking to it, coming to it commercially. But as Alexander dies, it just starts to fade in importance. There is a, well, well first, there's just another capital is established. And that capital just draws people to it. And people realize, I don't care about this old Babylon. I want to be in the new capital. It's nicer. It's better. And that's going to happen at the second coming. At the second coming, yes, the righteous are spared. Yes, you have, like the, the wicked, are burned as if by fire. But you're also going to have people who are good and honest people who will be here during the millennium of the first. And they're not going to be members of church. And some of them aren't going to know anything about Christ. And they'll be taught. Just like Babylon. They may be kind of a, a part of it. And it will slowly fade away as people leave their false traditions and come to Christ. Here's the way Bruce R. McConkie described that process. Elder McConkie said, sent, quote, Since all who are living at least a terrestrial law, the law of honesty, uprightness, integrity, will be able to abide the day of our Lord's coming, there will be non-members of the church on earth during the millennium, honest and upright people who have been deceived by the false religions and false philosophies of the world will not have their free agency abridged. They will continue to believe their false doctrines until they voluntarily elect to receive the gospel light. Speaking of the millennial period, Micah said, All people will walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of our Lord, our God, forever and ever. One of the prophecies that Isaiah makes is that Babylon, as it goes to nothing, will then become a place where no one ever dwells in it again. Verse 20, he says, It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Well, if you go there today, uh, by the way, one day I want to go. Um, there's no one living there today. Uh, Saddam Hussein built a palace there, and you can see some of the ancient uh, ruins there, but you don't have people living there. Uh, a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Now, moving to chapter 14. You ever thought of how you would draw Satan and hell? That's chapter 14. It's a description of Satan. It teaches a little bit about Satan and his motives. And it talks about hell. So, as I went through it in chapter 14, I'm starting in verse 9, I'm looking for like words that would help me if I'm drawing it. Hell, well, you got the dead there. Got that. You got kings there. You got important people there. And they're described as being, verse 10, weak. And, you know, they're down to the grave. Their bodies have worms in them. I don't know if you draw the worms, right? And they're fallen. And I know that part of that context is about Satan. But just thinking of fallen, not having as much power, cut down to the ground. In verse 15, it talks about the pit. Well, I just thought about that. And then there have been people who have awesome abilities in drawing, who've painted it. 
Michelangelo is one of them. Uh, Sistine Chapel, Last Judgment. You get the bottom of this little picture, or if you've ever been there, he's having these little devils pull him down into, into hell, and it's not a good place. Yet Dante's Inferno, where he's trying to draw, here's what hell looks like and what people suffer there. You have one with Sauron's Tower, you Lord of the Rings fan. And this is just kind of a picture of that, and I love the picture because in Sauron's Tower, right in the middle of it, there's a fish. Hey, I have no idea why there's a fish there. And maybe if one of you know, let me know, but I'll find out one of these days. But yeah, there's a fish in the middle of Sauron's Tower. But Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9, talks about the Hebrew word shoal, hell, Hades, words of, or a world of the dead. Jewish, ancient Jewish beliefs about shoal were these. First, they believed that the dead were alive there. They continued on their existence. Anciently, they believed that's where all the dead lived, in this one kind of place, Shoal. And Shoal, there is a personal continuity of personal recognition. You recognize people. Hey, there's there's somebody that I knew when I was growing up. Hey, there's my dad. There's you, when you go down the street, you recognize and you can communicate with them. And number and fourth, it's a place of weakness. They believe weakness with loss, not an enhancement of earthly powers. And they also believed that the dead wait in Shoal for a fullness. They wait there for a future enhancement to their spirits. So that's ancient Jewish beliefs. Now, some believe there was a physical resurrection. Some don't. Pharisees believed in it. Sadducees did not. That's why they're sad, you see. Okay, I hope you like that, that little joke. Um, and you get Satan in, uh, described in this chapter. Now, just a couple definitions. The, the word Satan literally means to accuse or to attack, to slander. Then the word Lucifer, the title Lucifer, the name Lucifer, means light bearer or shining one. Perdition, and he was called perdition. Perdition means loss or destruction. Satan as a son of the morning, okay? He is described in the spirit world as weak as other spirits and fallen from heaven. You get that in Isaiah 14, verse 13. And you get Satan's motive here. The dialogue, for thou, Satan, has said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of the God. I, that's his problem. It's all about him. I, I will also sit in the mound of the congregation, uh, just so you know. That is a Babylonian kind of reference where they thought, hey, there's a congregation of all these false gods. They all get together. Just like we get together in council, they get together. But the false gods that are on the north side, they're the ones where the Babylonian gods dwell. All the other gods are somewhere else. But they're on the north side because that's the important side. And so Satan is saying, I'm going to sit in not only in congregation, but in the north, because I'm number one. And verse 14, I will ascend above the clouds, heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's all Satan's focus is about him. He has eye problems. And when he arrives in Shoal, in Isaiah 14, 5, he's not even noticed. Not even takes, kind of like, who are you? As he's there on the sides of the pit. He's, he's compared to a diseased carcass. You got a diseased carcass, you just get rid of it. Right, you burn it or bury it. Or broken, or what we call it the abominable branch. It branch maybe has disease, you just, you get rid of it too. No one notices him, and they shun him. And in verse 20, it's talked about not that Satan will never have a body and never have a burial place. And the question is asked, how have you fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? Here's where you've headed. Here's your future. How is it possible that you fell? In chap this chapter, Isaiah teaches that the people in Shoal, that the saints, the people who are there, may think that the power of their destruction is in the feller or the woodchopper or Satan, but it's really not. They will now then there consider, discern who Satan really is, and marvel. And this is verse 16. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? They will understand when they're in Shoal that Satan has little power. They'll see his worth as like a carcass or a diseased or broken branch. Now also in this chapter, some of the things that it's teaching that God's reaction to all this Yes, there is a place where spirits are. Satan is, doesn't, isn't all that. But God has a plan. 
he is going to sweep the earth with the bosom or broom of destruction. And sometimes people read that and go, oh, he's going to be destroying. But you need to understand what that broom is. That sweeping is none other than happening by the use of the Book of Mormon in the world today. President Ezra F. Benson taught, the Book of Mormon is the instrument that God designed to sweep the earth as with a flood to gather out his elect. And Elder McConkie testified, few men on earth, either in or out of the church, have caught the vision of what the Book of Mormon is all about. Few are they among men who know the part is played and will yet play in preparing the way for the coming of him who is a new witness. The Book of Mormon shall so affect men that the whole earth and all its peoples will have been influenced and governed by it. There's no greater issue ever confront mankind in modern times than this. Is the Book of Mormon the mind and the will and the voice of God to all men? We testify that it is. Isaiah also teaches, so he's taught about Shoal, here's hell, <laughs> and also teaching about people's influence, the Spirit's influence, but God has a plan. He has a purpose in showing all this. And I love the way Isaiah says it. This, verse 26, is the purpose. That is purposed upon the whole earth. And I want you to point out, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations. you got to see God's hand stretching out still for you. 27, for the Lord has purposed. And who shall disannul it? God has a purpose. Who's going to cancel it out? Who's going to do something different with what God's, God's planned? And his hand is stretched out. Who shall turn it back? He has a purpose that is purposed on the whole earth, and this is the hand that stretched out upon all nations. In other words, if I could do verse 27 in my own words, nothing can stop God's plan for you and your life. Can't stop it for the church. He has a purpose. It's going to be accomplished. No one can stop God's plan for you. Not hell. Not Satan. Trust in God. Now, here's a little background. I'm going to shift gears to some sections that we, or chapters we really don't cover, 24 to 30. And it really is Isaiah makes prophecy in Isaiah 10 that Assyria is going to get all, all bad and come down and attack Israel. So as it comes down, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the Assyrian army is going to get really, really close to Jerusalem. As the Assyrians began their invasion, King Hezekiah begins preparations to protect Jerusalem. In an effort to deprive the Assyrians of water, the springs outside the city were blocked. Workers then dug a 533-meter tunnel to the spring of Gilan, providing the city with fresh water. Additional siege preparations included fortifications of existing walls, constructions of towers, and the erection of a new reinforcing wall. And Isaiah is going to mention all of it. Okay, here's the top of the spring. And going into the tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel. And that 533-foot uh, tunnel, you can kind of see that actually the, the, the Jews of the day start on one end, start on the other one, and amazingly, met right in the middle. There's no seam or anything. That's pretty good engineering. And then here's a lower pool. And there's also, so you get Isaiah 22, just a little bit of background. They know they have to reinforce things, so they take a bunch of houses and just tear them apart and make a wall. They call it the broad wall. And here's a picture of the remnants of what it looks like in Jerusalem today. And you can see off to the side, if you, can, if you may want to pause the video on this, you'll see a, like a measuring stick. And kind of like, hey, here's anciently how big, how tall this wall was. Okay, here's today's street level, okay, up here. And that's verse 10. You have numbered the houses of Jerusalem and the houses you've broken down to fortify this wall. That used to be houses. And Assyria's coming and that's the big theme for the rest of what we study today. Isaiah knows that this is a nation in peril. Assyria is on its way. So what advice does Isaiah give? What does the Lord inspire him to say on the eve of a nation's peril? Now this is kind of broad and I'm only selecting a few verses, sample verses. And so what I plan to do is just go through with my scriptures and read them. Hopefully that works for you. And uh, I'll just list them up on, on the screen here, and then I'm just reading and maybe making a little commentary. So, 
verse uh, chapter 22, verse uh, 11. He made a ditch between the two walls of the water of the old pool. You, you have that Hezekiah's tun uh, tunnel, but ye have not looked to the maker thereof, neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. Hey, you've done these preparations, but you have to focus and trust in God. Military preparations are good, but you're going to be saved by God. Then skipping over to chapter 25, verse 1, 3, and 4. So 25, verse 1. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I'll praise thy name. For thou hast done wonderful things, thy counsels are of old, are faithfulness and truth. Uh, you know, the righteous are always praising God here. And verse 3 and 4. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, God, and the spiritual people are going to glorify you. Verse 4. Thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. The reminder, God provides refuge. Verses 6 through 9, And in this mountain, temple, the Lord of hosts will make all people a feast of fat things. I know, today we don't like that idea of eating fat things, but fat things back then are the rich things of the earth, the delightful delicacies. How's that? A feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, wines on the lees well refined. These lees are, are the jellies. It's the nice things. God's got you. It's not just going to be, he's going to provide. He's going to provide really, really well. Verse 8, he'll swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. Hey, he's got you. There's going to be some, some tears. But I just pause here and I just think in my life, who's close enough to me that I let them willingly wipe away tears from my eyes? I mean, hey, I want to be known as a manly man. I don't want anyone to even see my tears. Nonetheless, let them wipe away. But there's an idea that you're going to have a relationship with God where you will feel comfortable that he will wipe away. And there's an indication here, it's not just wipe away, but get rid of these reasons for tears. The rebuke of the people will be taken away. All losses will be restored. God overcomes death. He'll save us. 26 verse 1. And in that day, there's going to be a song, Son, we have a strong city. Salvation with will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. You have divine protection. And verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. If you want perfect peace, just trust in God. Verse 9 of chapter 26, seek God early. And verse 12, the Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. So in the even nation's peril, Isaiah is emphasizing there's peace in God. You may have tumult, you may be having all these anxieties that Assyria is coming, but there's peace in God. 27, 1 through 3, okay? Um, there's the great Leviathan, verse 1, serpent, dragon. That, these are symbols of chaos, of the dragon, and of, of destruction. And in that day, verse 3, I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it, this, this uh, vineyard, every moment. At least any heard it. I will keep it night and day. I've got this. Chaos is going to be around. You're going to be threatened. But I'm going to be the one watering the vineyard. You're my vineyard. I'll help you out. Okay, 28, 16. I know I'm skipping quite a bit. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. You want in your nation's peril? I've got it, you, Christ. I'm going to give you a foundation stone. I'm going to give you a tried stone, a true stone, a cornerstone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. I'm going to give you Christ. If you when you're in peril. 29, 14. Now, I know this is context of the Book of Mormon, but there's also, I will provide, proceed to do a marvelous work in among, among this people, even a marvelous work in a wonder. That's part of what on nation's peril God's going to do. 30, verse 19 says, For the people shall dwell in Jerusalem, Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee. At the voice of thy cry, when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. You're going to have some challenges. You're going to have some tears. 
but he's going to hear you and answer you. And then all the way skipping to the end of verse 26, in that day, the Lord bindeth up the breach. There's going to be some challenges. There's going to be a breach. He'll bind it up and healeth the stroke of their wounded. You know, we live in a day where we all get spiritually wounded. And God has that power to heal the wounds. And 32, verse 17, which honestly is probably my all-time favorite verse in Isaiah. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance. That assurance can be also translated as hope forever. And section 59 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 23, says that in a little different word, different words. President Henry B. Eyring said this, one of my favorite quotes from him. One of the passages in Isaiah, which you may sometimes pass by too quickly because you think you won't understand it, makes perfect sense. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. But you might well say, do I have to wait until I'm perfect, and the people around me are perfect before I can live in peace? I suppose the answer is yes, if you mean to live in perfect peace. But there is a much happier answer, and a true one. It is this. We are promised peace in this life before we are perfect. That peace comes through Christ. President Marion G. Romney observed that this peace is obtainable in this life and is a taste, a harbinger, a foretaste of the peace that's in store for the righteous saints. He said, quote, The fullness of eternal life is not obtainable in mortality, but the peace of which it is, its harbinger, and comes as a result of making one's calling election sure, is attainable in this life. So, then we get 33, uh, just got a couple more I'm going to be reading here. 33, 13 to 16. Hear ye that are far off. Verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Yeah, okay, that's, we got that in Zion. And hey, honestly, I'm one of them. I'm not doing, I do my best. Okay, but verse 15, he that worketh, walketh righteously, which we're trying to do every day, and speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh the hands from holding bribes, that stoppeth the ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his, ears, his eyes from evil. Now, going back to the end of verse 14, these are they who will dwell in everlasting burnings. Because I, kind of the way Joseph Smith explained these verses. He said, you walk, if you want to get in with God's his everlasting burnings, you walk uprightly, you keep your covenants. And you speak uprightly. You make covenants. You don't profit by extortion. You're honest. Stop hearing a blood. Maybe way, another way of saying is you don't commit violence. You don't commit those murders. You are not a participant in evil. Okay, 35, uh, 3 through 4. Once again, this is words that Isaiah are given for people who are on the eve of nation's peril. Verses 3 through 4. Strengthen ye the weak hands. Confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, God will come with vengeance, even God with recompense. He will come and save you. Hey, be strong. He's going to save you. And 37, I'm going to go really quick. I've got lots of verses there, but I'm going to go really quick. Verse 1, when Hezekiah, when Hezekiah hears it, here's what he does. He does four, three things. Well, four things. Goes to the temple. Verse 1. He seeks the counsel of the prophet. He prays to the Lord. Verse 15. And one of the things that verses that I have up there is when after he has prayed, get verse 21, this is chapter 37, then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent unto Hezekiah, this is after his prayer, saying, Thus saith the God of Israel, whereas thou hast prayed unto me, God heard your prayer, but God also waited until you prayed. And then I love what he does. Uh, he then speaks the words of the prophet Isaiah to the people. Here's what he says. So this is in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 6. Here's the preparations of war, and then here's the words. Verse 6. He set captains of war over the people, gathered them in this, together to him in the street and the gate of the city, and spake, love what he does, comfortably. If you're in a time of peril, what words are you going to use that are going to give comfort to people? Saying, quote, be strong and courageous. He's quoting Isaiah. He's also bringing in some of Joshua's words. Be not afraid, 
nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitudes is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah the king, whose words are resting on Isaiah's, because he got that counsel. So, and Isaiah, I know I'm just going to cover just a couple things in the in our readings. So this is Isaiah uh, 25, 6 through 9. And in this mountain, temple of the Lord of hosts shall make unto people, we talked about this earlier, a feast of fat things. We may not like that, but this it's a just delicious. It's not just sustaining, it's an experience too. And he will destroy in the mountain, verse 5, He's going to get rid of all these bad things. Verse 6, he swallows up death in victory. Wipe away tears. And it shall be said, now verse 9, in that day, lo, he is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad, future tense, and rejoice in his salvation. I guess I reread this and add verse 9 because of that word wait. Elder Hales had a great observation about that word wait in scripture. We wait for the Lord, Elder Hales said. In the scriptures, the word wait means to hope, to anticipate, and to trust. To hope and to trust in the Lord requires faith, patience, humility, meekness, long-suffering, keeping the commandments, and enduring to the end. Now, Isaiah 28, I got you a couple pictures. I got a picture of a ladder going way, way up. And if you read those, those verses in Isaiah 28, 9 through 10, it talks about knowledge. You don't get knowledge all at once. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. Joseph Smith noted, it's not wisdom that we should have all knowledge at once presented before us, but that we should have little at a time. Then we can comprehend it. When you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and ascend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. One of the things that I try and do when I teach Isaiah is I do use a lot of pictures. And I say, okay, what does that stone have to do with Isaiah 28, 16? Well, Isaiah 20, 16, there saith the Lord God, behold, I'll lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And then often I'll just say, all right, how does that apply to Christ? And I'll have them, I want you to come up to the board and I want you to draw a cornerstone and inside it, write how that relates to Christ. And uh, then have them make notes from what other people have said of how Christ did the cornerstone in their life. Chapter 29 is an awesome chapter that foretells about the land among the Nephites and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Woe to Ariel, that's the city of David, right? Jerusalem, to Ariel where the city of David, where David dwelt. Add year to year. There's a process of time. Here's now a future. Isaiah is saying this is a future event. Hey, verse 2, there's going to be some distress in Ariel. And sorrow. And verse 3, I'll camp against thee round about. I'll lay a siege against thee. Use the descendants. I'll raise forts against thee. Thou shalt be brought down. Thou shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be out of the dust. And thy voice shall be as one have a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Well, you are like unto Ariel. In this, yes, this is, you start off with Jerusalem, and then you go year to year, and then you, Isaiah changes and says, yet it's going to be, this is going to what's going to happen to those who are descendants of the Nephite Lamanites. They're going to have a voice that's going to speak from the dust. It's going to be familiar. Not with, maybe some with vocabulary, but familiar is with the spirit, how it feels with the Bible. Elder Grand Richards noted this. If you'll read that thoughtfully, you'll know that he not only saw the destruction of Jerusalem, but he saw the destruction of another great center like unto Jerusalem. Then he adds, And thou shalt be brought down and speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be, as it were, as one familiar spirit, out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Nobody in this world could explain that intelligently or know what people what people Isaiah saw like unto Jerusalem without the Book of Mormon. Ellen McConkie also noted, And thou, ye Nephites, saith the Lord, shall be brought down and shall speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that has a familiar spirit. Out of the ground, now the speech shall whisper out of the dust. Where else in all history are there two better examples of peoples who are brought down and utterly destroyed than the Jaredites and the Nephites, and whose voices, being stilled in death, yet speak from their graves for all to hear? 
Does not their united voice have a familiar spirit? Is it not whispering out to the ground of the same prophetic message that is now and always has been the burden of living prophets? Does not the Book of Mormon proclaim a familiar message, one already written in the Bible? And then you get verse 11. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that has learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. There's a prophecy that really is referring to a couple individuals. You have Samuel Mitchell and Charles Anton. And these two are brilliant men. And you have um, Martin Harris, who's just getting pressure from, from family, from his wife. And I think he has a testimony, but he just wants a little bit more proof because wife's maybe giving him a hard time. Can I just take some characters and just, if I have it translated, and then I can show, go back and show Ma or my wife that this really is the work of God, it'll all work out for me. And you, you know the story. He asks once, no. Asked twice, no. Asked third time, yes, here's some conditions. And, well, a short time after the Smiths arrived in Harmony, Martin paid them a visit and expressed a desire to assist Joseph. He proposed journey east to New York City with a transcription of some of the characters on the plates to show them to scholars. He departed February 1828, and en route to New York City, he stopped in Albany to visit Luther Bradish, a former Palmyrian resident and family friend who traveled extensively through the Near East and Egypt. Martin sought his opinion about whom to visit regarding the translation, and then pressed on to New York to visit Samuel L. Mitchell, a linguist and one of the leading scholars on ancient American culture. After examining the characters, Mitchell evidently sent Martin to Charles Anton, a young professor of grammar and logistics at Columbia College. Anton had been collecting American Indian stories and speeches for publication, was eager to inspect the doc document Martin brought him. Martin claimed that Anton declared the characters authentic until he learned how Joseph Smith had acquired them. He suggested Martin bring him the plates. Martin refused, and Anton replied, paraphrasing a verse in Isaiah, I cannot read a, read a sealed book. Although Ant was later denied the details of Martin's account in the, of their meeting, we do know this. Martin came away from his visits with the Eastern scholars more convinced than ever that Joseph Smith was called of God and the plates and characters were ancient. He and Joseph viewed the visit to Anton as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, also mentioned in the Book of Mormon itself, of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is right, learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And as a part of what Isaiah chap prophesies in uh, chapter 29 is that there will be a marvelous work and a wonder that will come forth in our day. We are witnesses of that marvelous work and a wonder. And we see that. Therefore, behold, I'll proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. And I make just a little note with Martin Harris. In 1818, Martin was instructed by the Spirit not to join any church until the words of Isaiah were fulfilled in those verses. And then when it comes that they're fulfilled, he knows this is now the time to join the church. Elder McConkie quoted these verses and then said this, quote, When these divine words were uttered, they had reference to the restoration of the gospel in our day, and some of these very words were quoted by the Son of God in the first vision. Many Latter-day revelations identify the marvelous work here named as the restored gospel. There's also a timeline. Here's when this is going to happen. And I love it in verse 17. It is not yet a very little while. After this restoration, once you get the Book of Mormon and it's published, not yet very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field. And the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. I love the way Elder Marky e. Peterson noted that. Okay, got the Book of Mormon. Here's the prophecy. And Lebanon becomes a fruitful forest. And he says this. Not only did the prophets predict its appearance, but Isaiah set a limit on the time of its publication. That limit was related to the period when fertility would return to Palestine. Isaiah said the book would come forth first, and then added, In a very little while, Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. The time limit has expired. This new volume of scripture must have come forth before now, or Isaiah was not a true prophet, for Palestine is fruitful again. Where is that book? I just love that. Now, Isaiah chapter 36 and 37 is a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 10. I know it's not part of the reading, but here's two bonus minutes. Remember in Isaiah chapter 10, there's a prophecy. Assyria is going to come down, and they're going to get really, really close to Jerusalem. Close enough that they're going to be close enough to say, hey, we're going to get you next day, and the Lord will deliver them. 
Well, in chapter 36, the 14th year, the king of Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Jerusalem, of Judah, and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rakshaka from Lakesh. And by the way, scenes from the destruction of Lakesh are, uh, were, were made in the frescoes of the Assyrian capital, and uh, they're just gruesome. It's, you, you look those up, and you can kind of see some of the things that they suffered. And Jerusalem's anticipating that's what we're going to suffer too. So he sends his little chief spokesperson up and to, to Hezekiah, verse 2, with great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool and the highway the fullers filled. And here's what he says. He uses reason against him. 36, verse 4, and vain words, verse 5. He taunts them in verse 8. He threatens them in verse 9. He's loud. And he says it in a language that everybody can understand. And he preaches against God's power in verse 15. And he tells them, give up, verse 16. And he blasphemes the Lord in verse 18. And I bring that up because he's a lot like Satan. Satan, like this servant of the Assyrian king, uses reason to destroy us, to attack us, vain words, and taunts us, and threatens us, and is loud sometimes. Satan is so loud, the spirit seems to be so soft and quiet and whispering. But the decibels of decadence are loud in a language you can understand. Satan, like the servant, preaches against God's power and tells you just to give up, blasphemes the Lord. And chapter 37, verse 33, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a blank against it. By the way that he came, the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city, to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then an angel of the Lord went forth, and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, and returned, and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass while he was worshipping the house of Nishrosh, his god. Two of his sons come up with the sword and kill him. And they escape. And there's another account, which I actually like better because it's, it's, it's kind of cool. But he's in, this, in, the, in his god's little temple. He's worshipping. And his sons come up with one of the gods of the um, Babylon and kills him with that, with that other god. And uh, I just kind of like that because it's like poetic justice. You're praying to your God and it doesn't do any work. Now the God of Babylon that you mock killed you. That just what comes around goes around. But uh, scriptures say he was smote by the sword. I'm going with that. I love the way the Lord, Lord Byron describes it. So poetic. I'm not very much of a poet, but I love these, these verses. Here's Lord Byron about the destruction of Sacrib. This year and came down like a wolf on the fold. And his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the sheen of their spears were like stars on the sea when the blue waves rolled whitely on the deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest when summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen. Like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, that host on the morrow lay lithered and strown. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed. And the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts once heaved and forever grew still. And there lay that the steed with his nostril all wide, and through it there rolled not the breath of his pride. And the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf, and cold as a spray of the rock-beating surf. And there lay the rider, distorted and pale, with the dew on his brow and the rust on his nail. And the tenants were all silent, the banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpets unblown. And the widows of Asper are loud in their wail and the idols are broken in the temple of Baal. And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow at the glance of the Lord. Sennacherib's faults God failed to protect him. An ironic contrast to Hezekiah's prayer at the temple and subsequent deliverers from his enemies, not to mention the irony of Sacronim's message to Hezekiah, not to rely on the Lord because the Lord would not save him. And then just as a side note, uh, when Sennacherib does get back to Assyria, he gives his account. And I'll put this in my notes, but in a sense, he says, yeah, I went up and I went to Jerusalem and I caged him like a bird. And then goes on to describe how I was so 
splendorous. I terrified them and everybody was afraid. And then I decide, yeah, I decided I'd just leave them and I came back. So there's no mention of the death of 185,000. There's no mention he took the city either because people knew that. But he's like, I just decided I'd just let him breathe another day. But I just close. In a time of peril, Isaiah gave hope to those who are righteous, to those who are strong. He gave this, these, these words, Strengthen ye the weak knees, the weak hands, and confirm the weak feeble knees. Say to them of fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with recompense. He will come and save you. I know that's true. Be strong. We need to give that word out. Things may look bad at times, but God will come. He will give recompense and make all the wrongs righted. I hope today that you've learned some things that were applicable to you that gave you hope, that lift your hearts, that helped you rejoice a little bit. And thank you for spending a little bit of time with me today. I know Isaiah is relevant, applicable, and gives hope in our lives today. And as you teach this, I, that's the one thing I'd be just emphasizing, re 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 uh, relevance, applicability, and hope found in teachings. And you got the big themes. And for me, one of the big themes in a time of nation's peril is he's giving, hey, if you're not quite right, get right with the Lord and have hope. you got to trust in him. You're doing all these military things, that's okay, but you're going to be delivered by God. And ultimately, we are delivered by God. And then as you kind of study that advice and that uplifting message and that warning, maybe be thinking, what are modern-day prophets warning us about? How are they uplifting us? How are they giving us hope? And then one of the main focuses, if I'm teaching this uh, in a, like a gospel doctrine or to my family, I would definitely spend a lot of time on Isaiah 29. It is awesome and talks about the Book of Mormon and just a testimony of the truthfulness of that book. Thank you for spending some time with me. And once again, if um, you want any of the quotes, I'll have them at brothermiller.org. And once again, another shout out to Cedar Fort. Sure appreciate what they did in in publishing my two-volume set. Have a great day. Keep smiling.